Chapter 7 Elizabeth Elizabeth inhaled deeply as she poked her head out of the dusty coach. She'd never thought she would miss the smell of the outside, but after two days on the train and another day stuffed in the much smaller carriage, she couldn't get enough of the open air. Thankfully, the time had given her the ability to send word to Carl of her arrival, but she couldn't say she had enjoyed the journey. Not only had she been worried that Jacob would be waiting for her at every stop, but she hadn't slept well, not having the money for a sleeping car. Add in the odor of people and the need to sit most of the time, and to say she was glad to have arrived and be able to stretch her limbs would be an understatement. She looked around the town and marveled at how different it was from Chicago, more different than she would have imagined. Instead of a bustling town filled with many roads, the sounds of buggies and people and colorful stores, this place was empty and brown. All of the buildings, not that there were many, were brown, nearly the same shade of brown as the landscape so that they almost seemed to blend into each other. The driver took her loan bag and helped her down, and as he handed the bag back to her, a large man approached her. He towered over her both in height and in girth, and had a slight limp as he neared, but she did not shy away. Unlike the men she had just left, this one didn't seem as foreboding. Yes, he was formidable, but there was a gentle air about him. She prayed her instincts were correct, for if they were not, this man could easily squeeze the life out of her body. He took his hat off, and his dark hair moved slightly in the breeze. Miss Parker? His voice was deep but soft at the same time. And as she looked closer, she could see the traces of nervousness in his darting eyes and the excessive swallowing in his throat. It wasn't like he was trying to lie to her, more like he was afraid to look her in the eye and hold the gaze. Why was he nervous? I am. I presume you are Mr. Baxter? He was not exactly the way she had pictured him, but he had not lied about his traits. He nodded and held out a hand. It was strong and calloused, definitely a hand that saw hard work. She blinked at it for a moment. Was it customary to shake hands with women here? As he didn't lower it, she placed her hand in his and let him pump her hand once more. Do you need anything else in town or are you ready to proceed to the church? Already? A light pink flashed across Carl's cheeks. I took the liberty of informing Pastor Lewis of our marriage when I received word of your expected arrival. I assumed that you wouldn't feel comfortable under the same roof unless we were married. Was I mistaken? No, not at all. Elizabeth should have been prepared for this, but she supposed in her mind that she had thought he would put her in a hotel and court her for a few days to make sure marriage was the right step or at least put her in a hotel for a night so that she could bathe and make herself presentable. There had been no way to freshen up on the coach, and Elizabeth had no doubt that she looked a mess. While she knew this was not a marriage based on love, she could not deny the want to at least wash her face and comb her hair. If there is a room at the church where I may change and freshen up, that would be acceptable. If not, is there such a room nearby? Carl hooked his thumbs in his trousers and looked about. I'm not certain if there is a room like that in town, other than at the inn, but there is a small washroom at the church. Elizabeth took a deep breath and nodded. That will do then. Carl gave a single nod in response, replaced his hat, and then held out his hand for her bag. She hesitated, wanting to hold on to it. After all, it held everything she owned in the world but she worried he might take the gesture as a slight. And to be truthful, she was tired. Three long days with jittery nerves and little sleep was certainly taking its toll on her. Letting him carry the bag for a short time would be welcome. She allowed him to take the bag, and though she knew it was heavy, he hefted it as though it was no more than a sack of feathers. Is this all you have? He asked, his eyes darting around for the rest of her things. This is almost all I own. The bank took most of what my father still owned, and what they didn't was placed in storage until I can show them proof of marriage. 
There were a few things she had left at the saloon that she wished she could have taken, but she wasn't going to mention that. He might send her back if he knew she'd been working at a saloon. He considered her for a minute before nodding. If you'll follow me, then. Your limp, is it serious? She couldn't help asking, as he led the way to an open wagon. It would change nothing, she'd given her word after all, but if it would require extra care, she felt it only fair to know up front. He smiled at her as he placed her bag in the back. Not too serious. I was a little careless this morning in my rush to come get you, and I wasn't paying attention to where my horse was stepping until he landed on my foot. It aches a little, but I'm sure it will be fine. Have you had a doctor check it? She asked as she took his proffered hand and climbed into the wagon. He chuckled. No, Doc Moore has his hands full with other patients. He doesn't need to tell me my foot is bruised. If it gets worse, I'll go see him. But what if it's broken? She asked. Won't walking on it make it worse? It's not broken, I promise, he said, as he limped over to the driver's side of the wagon. If it was, I wouldn't be able to walk at all. We may only have one official doctor, but out here you learn a lot about medical care in the field, and I promise you, this is nothing. Deciding this was not an argument she was going to win, she simply nodded and looked around. Is the church very far? He sat down beside her and took the reins. It's just down there. He pointed to the far end of town. Not far at all, but I figured you wouldn't want to walk all the way there on our dusty roads. Plus, my foot could use a rest. Well, consider it. Elizabeth doubted she could get any dirtier from walking than she'd gotten just from riding in the dusty coach. But she said nothing, and instead tried to familiarize herself with the town as they rode through it. There was a general store, though it looked much smaller than the one she was familiar with back in Chicago. A man with dirty blonde hair leaned against the railing. His eyes were closed, but his lips moved slightly, making her wonder if he was talking to himself or simply dreaming. Then a saloon came into view, quite similar to the one she had left, and she suppressed a shudder as she thought back to her time spent there. She hoped she would never have to do anything like that again. A small hotel was on the way, as was an eatery. She wondered if her soon-to-be husband ever ate there, though she doubted it. Even in Chicago, restaurants were considered a luxury and not often attended. Finally, they pulled up in front of a quaint clapboard church. The white siding appeared to have been freshly painted, and though the place was not nearly as large as the church she left in Chicago, it was welcoming. Carl tied up the horse and then helped her down before retrieving her bag. Does this have everything you need? Yes, thank you. Her possessions might be few, but her bag did contain her nicest dress and shoes, a brush, and a small mirror that she could use if the washroom was without. She clutched the bag to her chest and followed Carl into the church. Like the outside, the inside boasted a welcoming atmosphere. Rows of pews filled each side of a middle aisle that led to the front. A small piano sat to one side, and a simple pulpit stood in the middle. A man wearing all black except for the small white square designating him as a man of the cloth looked up from the pulpit as they entered. Welcome, you must be Miss Parker. I'm Pastor Lewis. A warmth emanated from the man as if he was personally blessed by God, and Elizabeth immediately felt comfortable in his presence. I am. Would you be able to point me to the washroom before we begin? The pastor smiled. Of course, follow me. He led her to a small doorway behind the pulpit and opened the door for her. My quarters are to the left, but you'll find the washroom to the right. Thank you. Elizabeth followed his directions and found herself in a room much smaller than the one she had become accustomed to at home. It was big enough for her to change, but just barely. However, she was delighted to see a wash basin with a mirror above it. At least she wouldn't have to try and fix her hair using her much smaller mirror, and the water in the basin appeared clean. She wondered how often the pastor changed it, or if he had done it specifically for this visit. She washed her face first and brushed her hair, twisting it into the current style and securing it with pins. Then she pinched her cheeks to bring a little more color to them and pressed her lips together to do the same. 
Finally, she changed out of her soiled dress and into the nicest one she had in the bag. It was slightly wrinkled due to its time in the carpet bag, but that could not be helped, and somehow she doubted that Mr. Baxter would care too much. When she had also changed her shoes, she appraised her appearance once more in the mirror, decided it would do, and returned the soiled clothes to the carpet bag to be washed later. Then she took a deep breath and returned to the pulpit where the men stood waiting for her. As the pastor began speaking, she took the time to look at the man who would now be her husband. She felt that he would be safer than Jacob, but that did nothing to quell the nerves bunching in her stomach. Would he be a good man? Would she adjust to this life so very different from the one she'd left? Would she be able to fulfill her wifely duties to him? And would he give her time to adjust? Do you, Carl Baxter, take Miss Parker as your lawfully wedded wife? to honor and care for as long as you live? I do, Carl said, and the pastor turned to her. Do you, Elizabeth Parker, take Mr. Baxter as your lawfully wedded husband, to honor and care for as long as you live? I do, Elizabeth said, her voice shaking only slightly. This was not how she'd imagined her life going, but as she looked at the man before her, she realized he was a decent-looking man, Maybe not the kind that would have grabbed her fancy if they'd passed on the streets. He was larger than the picture of her perfect man, and his face looked a little more weathered and hard than she would have wanted. But there was a kindness in his eyes and a gentleness in his touch as he held her hands. Then by the power given to me by the great state of Texas and the Lord Almighty, I pronounce you husband and wife. Thank you, Pastor, her husband said, clearly declaring the end to the ceremony. The pastor nodded and wished them well before retiring to the back room. I guess you'd like to see the homestead now, Carl said. Elizabeth wasn't sure about that. She imagined the homestead would be as simple as the town, and she doubted there would be much to see, but she kept those words to herself. I cannot think of anything else I should be doing. All right then, let's go. As he helped her back into the wagon, Elizabeth felt a tremor race down her spine. She glanced around, looking for any person that appeared out of context. She doubted that Jacob Canfield would follow her all the way out here, and she'd been careful about covering her tracks when she left. But that knowledge did nothing to dispel the fear that seemed to envelop her. Perhaps it was simply a fear of the unknown. She was about to embark on a journey she had never expected— in a new town, married to an unfamiliar man, and with no idea of what would be expected of her. Yes, that had to be it. Fear of the unknown and nothing more. She would continue to repeat those words over in her head until they rang true in her heart.